The Darkest Moments in TV History, Part 2, by Nick Crowley. What's good? How your day going? How your morning, your evening, your night, whenever you're watching this video, blah. Hey, as this video play though, we're going to definitely kick some ish because, man, me and my partner was just talking about something similar to this topic yesterday. Look, we, let's get to this video as it play out. Be ready for me to talk your ear off, dog. You want to check out the original video? Link will be in the description below, but let's go. The following video contains videos and stories that some may find disturbing. January 11th, 2001, famed Brazilian actress, model, and singer Xuxa lands her prop spaceship on the stage of a Brazilian TV set and begins her show the way she always does. The program, titled Xuxa Park, was a hit for the Ready Global Network, targeting a demographic of young children with its over-the-top dance numbers, fun games, and immersive futuristic sets. Premiering back in the summer of 94, Shusha Park had shown little signs of slowing down by the turn of the century, and seemed poised for a long, impressive run, barring any unforeseen disaster. On this particular day, 300 children were in attendance to watch or participate in the show's activities. Shusha's infectious energy led the way from segment to segment as they played games, showed cartoons, and of course, sang their songs. And by the end of the episode, the crew had all gathered on stage to perform one last musical number, to end things off with a bang. And evidently, that's exactly what would happen. This frame was taken just over one minute later revealing all that remained of the set, as within that impossibly short window of time, oh, the damn. once bright and inviting scenery was turned to a pitch black, unrecognizable hellscape, barely comprehensible to the camera that was also just mere moments away from being swallowed by the flames, but not before it would capture the carnage firsthand. Hey, Shusha got out of there quick, though. In the blink of an eye, the spaceship which Shusha had rode in on and was moments away from re-entering to leave the set would catch fire, all while the dancers continued their performance, unaware of the emerging danger behind them. A member of the staff quickly enters the frame in an attempt to extinguish the flames, but it was already too late, as just a few seconds after the spark, the entire ship was engulfed by the blaze, causing a mass panic on the set. Worst of all, directly next to the fiery ship, and just barely no. out of view of the camera, was the show's signature Ferris wheel, which kids would ride during the program, including during this very moment. As the fire raged, one boy was trapped in his seat, helpless to the danger unfolding around him. And noticing this, a group of brave people on scene began desperately trying to free him, which can just barely be seen on the left-hand side of the screen. Thankfully, their attempts proved successful, as he was eventually freed from a seat and carried to safety. The fire was later determined to have started by an electrical short circuit, and the set would soon be completely turned to ash and rubble. But as for the nearly 300 children and numerous staff on scene, despite multiple injuries, everyone had somehow managed to escape the building with their lives, with the only reported fatality being the show itself as this would be the last episode. Hey, i gladly take that one, especially with the way it started. I was like, oh, it's about to be one of them shows where, because we know some kids in it, so what's about to happen? Nah, it didn't go that way, though. Actually, they were, they were legit gigging. It was an actual vibe, an actual show for kids. She come down looking like the Jetsons and ish in a spaceship, but it was a fire hazard. And everybody got out that month. Thank goodness, dog. I'll take that story so far. And numerous oh, staff on scene. Despite multiple injuries, Ooh, everyone had somehow managed to escape the building with their lives, with the only reported fatality being the show itself, as this would be the last episode ever filmed, with Shusha Park being swiftly cancelled. Thankfully, Damn, this moment- that's wild. I mean, 
That one ain't really dark. That one's scary. It ain't really dark, though. And they, did they cancel it because of that? I mean, shit happened, dog. With Shusha Park being swiftly canceled, they save people. Man, what? Thankfully, this moment saw all parties involved survive the ordeal, a rarity in the world of disturbing television moments. Though it does highlight just how quickly things can go downhill when the cameras are rolling, and when these dark moments ultimately happen, all we can really do is watch. Something happened that turned this video into a horror. Here we go. Yeah. Fourteen day free trial and see if your personal information has been leaked online. I'm gonna leave the links in my description as well. Chapter one. Very. There are very few manners of death that strike fear among us as much as the horrifying prospect of being buried alive. The dark, claustrophobic nature of it, slowly losing oxygen with not a thing in the world you can do to stop it. It just strikes a chilling chord with so many. However, with this fear arose a unique opportunity for those looking to make a spectacle. Rather than running from this Dini. mortal fear, a select few magicians and daredevils have tried their hand at the challenge of being buried alive. By not just surviving, but escaping. The trick was popularized by arguably the greatest magician of all time, Harry Houdini, who tried his hand at the stunt on a few separate occasions, the first of which would see him narrowly escape a casket buried under six feet of dirt by breaking through the surface with his fist, only to fall unconscious before he could complete the trick, with the stunt almost ending in his death. From there, he would be buried again on two separate occasions, surviving both for well over an hour, but never being able to fully pull himself out and in turn pull off the seemingly impossible. Houdini did have plans to give it one more try in 1927, when he believed the stunt would finally be completed, but sadly he would pass away before getting the opportunity. Because of this, the trick has acted as somewhat of a magnum opus for any magician able to pull off the feat, a feat that even the great Houdini himself couldn't accomplish. And so, on the 66th anniversary of his death, American escape artist Bill Shirk would honor the late magician by attempting to do just that. For the stunt, Shirk would add extra elements of flair, upping the danger by being handcuffed and having cement poured over top of the casket as opposed to just dirt. And he planned on doing it all with a TV crew on hand. However, from the get-go, things seemed to be off with the performance, as Shirk expressed concern over the grave being dug too wide and too long, thus changing the dynamics of his escape. Oh, I'm like this. I got a bad feeling about this thing. At one point, when the first layer of dirt was being applied, Shirk would use his walkie-talkie to tell his team to call off the whole ordeal and to pull him up from the ground, seemingly in a moment of clarity. But everything was already in motion. This was his big moment with everyone watching. I don't care. He couldn't afford to fail. Besides, he had been buried alive before, setting a record back in 1977 by spending a total of 79 hours beneath the surface of the earth. He was no stranger to this, and not wanting to let his fans down, Bill Shirk would change his mind and continue the stunt by giving his team the green light to begin pouring the cement. And as that concrete began to settle and harden over top of the casket, things take a very grim turn. Decides to go ahead. I think we gotta go. Tons of concrete are poured. Don't do it, Bill. Suddenly, the concrete sinks. The coffin has been crushed. Almost immediately, the level of liquid concrete dips dramatically, and large bubbles appear on the surface accompanied by a massive splashing noise. Signs that point to only one real possibility, that the weight of the concrete and dirt had caused the coffin to cave in, with those very same materials instantly filling in any available space inside the coffin, and in turn, suffocating Shirk. The rescue effort was underway almost instantly, but still, it felt like it was all moving in slow motion, and most assumed right away that if the weight of the concrete alone had not killed him, then the lack of oxygen certainly would. A backhoe digs, and digs, and crucial moments pass. Shirk cannot be found. <laughs> However, this thankfully wouldn't Get be the off. case. Hold on, my father. Incredibly Get Shirk. off. What a spam call is annoying. Get and the Shirk hell. Shirk cannot be found. However, this thankfully wouldn't be the case. 
Incredibly, Shirk managed to claw his way to the surface, where his team was able to pull him to safety and rush him into an awaiting ambulance. And though his good condition shit, appeared shit. severe, I'll take this video so to far, pull him dog. To safety and rush him into Stop an doing ambulance. that, man. And though his condition appeared severe, he was alive and had somehow cheated death. Thank, thank God he spared my life on this one, and uh, it'll be a while before I do one of these. I'll tell you that. He said it'd be a while before he do another one. And it somehow cheated death. Thank, thank God he spared my life on this one, and uh, it'll be a while before I do one of these. I'll tell you that. Despite claiming to be done with his stunt for a while, Shirk would be back to attempting his death-defying stunts soon after, with some ending in similar results. After Shirk climbs in the casket, the snake goes in first, but there's a problem, and Shirk has to get help. But although Bill Shirk was able to- Demo went right for the net! I, I don't know to say anymore at this point, dog. But although Bill Shirk was able to escape this trick with his life, not everyone has been so lucky. Two years every prior, time he escaped death, I ain't gonna lie, I'm glad, dog. But man, damn, what? <sighs> but although Bill Shirk was able to escape this trick with his life, not everyone has been so lucky. Two years prior to Shirk's run-in with death, another performer known as The Amazing Joe had attempted the same stunt at an amusement park. We just watched his. Also going the route of having dirt and wet cement poured over his plastic and glass coffin. This was Joe's attempt at becoming a master escape artist and forever etching himself into the history books of this particular niche. In fact, he had already done what Houdini couldn't, as years prior he had escaped from a wooden coffin covered in six feet of dirt. But this attempt was clearly much more extreme, and with it should have come an immense amount of planning, not only by Joe himself, but the team around him. However, according to reports, the coffin used was never actually tested to see if it could withstand such a great amount of weight. And also, he never tested the weight of the cement itself and the speed in which it would harden. Joe was quite literally going into this blind, and his confidence was apparent as the cherry on top of this poor planning was the fact that no rescue procedure was in place should the stunt go horribly wrong. And unsurprisingly, well, that's exactly what would happen. It was a cold night anyway, but man, when it sunk, I just knew trouble. We're in trouble. And it's not fun anymore. Much like the footage from Bill Shirk's attempted escape, the level of cement and dirt suddenly dips. Only this time- Since y'all usually always have y'all degree in every field in the comment section, um, would this be the same, be considered a, an adrenaline junkie? My bad, let me close this window real quick. Would this be the same thing, dog? Bill Shirk's attempted escape, the level of cement and dirt. I don't suddenly know, dipped. man. It just seemed like legit playing with death. That's what it seemed like. Much like the footage from Bill Shirk's attempted escape, the level of cement and dirt suddenly dips, only this time in a much more dramatic fashion, with the cave in being so brutal that I'm not sure I'll even be allowed to show it on YouTube. According to many onlookers there, the coffin That's being cool destroyed me, by that man. immense Don't weight that. caused a massive crashing noise, followed by immense panic from those trying to rescue Joe. But without a proper plan, the situation quickly grew helpless. And trapped beneath that dirt, surrounded by cheering fans, his parents, and a TV camera, Damn. the amazing Joe would lose his life. Ironically, within a coffin buried six feet under. <laughs> Sporting events are no stranger to disturbing TV moments, from hockey players having their throats cut open, oh, folks, this is ugly. Richard Zedek is cut wide open, to a football player suffering cardiac arrest right there on the field. They have been administering CPR through these past two breaks that we've taken. It's unfortunately always a risk Damn. in practically any televised sport out there. And although there's always a lingering chance that at any moment, things could go terribly wrong, that risk mainly pertains to the players actually participating in the sport. And you likely wouldn't imagine fans being in any sort of danger as they sit by watching the game. 
though sadly it does happen from time to time, with perhaps the most notable example being the story of Shannon Stone. Shannon was a 39-year-old firefighter who, on the 7th of July, 2011, took his son Cooper to watch a Texas Rangers game in Arlington. This was the perfect bonding opportunity for the duo, and an even better opportunity to catch fly balls, as their seats left them in prime position to take home an unforgettable souvenir. The two would even stop at a sporting store beforehand, where Shannon would buy his son a baseball glove to use in the event that a loose ball came flying their way. And as the game reached the top of the second inning, their moment had finally arrived. Oh, shit. Lying, but foul. I, when I looked at who the A's are facing. A foul ball was hit in their general direction, being quickly recovered by Rangers outfielder Josh Hamilton. And rather than returning the ball to the dugout or the field itself, Hamilton decided to make Cooper's day, recognizing the young fan in the stands and subsequently tossing the ball to Shannon. As this was all transpiring, the game continued with the pitcher preparing for his next throw, before suddenly, you can hear the sound of something strange. I want them to be great in their last <laughs> exactly. I would rather have that than have it like Holland where he just knocked off. It almost seemed like yelling, which was followed by some sort of strong reaction from the crowd, which in turn led to an immediate stoppage of play, as the announcers were left trying to figure out what exactly was happening, until they finally received word on the unfolding situation. He's got, got a lot of energy built up. I think somebody fell out of the stands in left field trying to uh, feel the baseball guy. Well, this is it. That's why there was time to take Damn. The man in this footage was, in fact, Shannon Stone. And as Josh Hamilton had gone to toss the ball up to him, the throw fell just a bit short, causing the 39-year-old father to extend past the railing before losing his balance. And despite the seemingly playful nature of the announcers at the time, You were right, Ray. Somebody did tumble. <laughs> this fall was no laughing matter, as below that railing stood a 20-foot fall directly onto a concrete floor, which Shannon would strike head first. As he laid there on the ground, barely able to move, the man was miraculously still conscious, finding the strength to tell the rescue team carrying him out, please check on my son. My son was up there all by himself. Based on this reaction, it was clear that Stone was obviously alive and had clear brain function, making his initial Don't prognosis on the scene somewhat promising. But before he would even reach a nearby hospital, Shannon Stone would be pronounced dead. According to many medical Rest professionals, peace, this immediate showing of brain function was more or less a fluke occurrence, and something they call a lucid interval, which is a window of conscious clarity after a traumatic injury, essentially meaning that although his ability to move and speak seemed to be a positive indicator, it was instead a sign that the injuries his brain had suffered were going to be fatal. In the years since, Shannon Stone's memory lives on with a statue being made in his honor hey, 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 in that very stadium right, where his life came to an end, forever immortalizing someone who, by all accounts, was a great man, Facts, an even man. better father. A firefighter, doing for the community, dangerous fucking job. Shouts out to you for that. A dope father. I'm taking my boy out to the baseball game, man. Get him a glove, going to have a good time. And that's the outcome. And who, by all accounts, was a great man and an even better father. We don't see or hear anything. It's good and bad, even a thing, dog. Man, man, fuck this, man. Let's watch this video, dog. Your father. Fars karma. Karma. Don't take that wrong. I want y'all to take that wrong. As far as karma goes, man. We don't see or hear anything. If you spent any considerable amount of time here on YouTube, then chances are you're at least somewhat familiar with the show To Catch a Predator. Hell During yeah. its run on Dateline, the show was incredibly popular, with its host Chris Hansen being launched into stardom for his role exposing pedophiles on the internet. How you doing? All right, I'm gonna have a seat over in that chair, please. At the time, there was really nothing else like this on TV, and was widely viewed as one of the most entertaining shows out there. 
which has caused it to find a second life here on YouTube, as re-uploads of its episodes have been viewed as many as 50 million plus times. To this day, the show remains immensely popular, and during its television run, the same was true, Nigga, which led me to wonder how or why it was ever taken off the air. I mean, it was entertaining, popular, and with the internet exploding in recent years, the content would seemingly be endless. Yet somehow, this show only lasted three years. And that's when I realized that there's actually a very specific reason why To Catch a Predator was pulled from the air, and it's one of the darker TV stories I've ever heard. During the fall of 2007, Perverted Justice, the team that To Catch a Predator used to find their predators, had set up a decoy account on MySpace, posing as a 13-year-old boy. And before long, another user had taken the bait, reaching out to the fake child in the hopes of sparking an intimate relationship. According to the user's account, he was a 19-year-old college student that happened to live in the same area. However, upon doing some light digging, the Perverted Justice team discovered that the man was actually in his late 50s. His name was Louis Kondrat, and although his behavior was similar to essentially all other predators in the show's run, sending explicit messages and pornographic images despite knowing he was speaking to a child, Louis was different in one respect. It seems that Kondrat was in a position of power, working as a chief felony assistant district attorney for Rockwall County. This was setting up to be To Catch a Predator's oh biggest catch to date, and exposing him would not only mean bringing him to justice, but also bringing in great ratings for the show. Though there was one major issue. Upon engaging the decoy for a few hours and even calling to speak to him. Hello? Hey, Will. Hey, what are you doing? Nothing, what are you doing? Nothing. No? No, I was looking up to see how to get to where you are. Still thinking about me? Yeah, where's your right hand? Um, it's in my pocket. In your pocket? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you doing with your right hand in your pocket? Lewis stopped responding. That was a quick ad. I didn't even have to skip the it. Grave error he was making, and began deleting all content from his account. And as a few days passed, it was clear that Lewis was not going to be visiting their sting house, which meant no program and no justice. However, the To Catch a Predator team was not going to let this go easily, with the crew coming up with a plan that had never been done before in the history of the show. They were going to bring the program to Kondrat. And so on November 5th, Hansen and his crew would visit Kondrat's house with a group of officers and an arrest and oh, search warrant. Oh, I do remember this This would one. not be without I controversy, do. though, as the warrants supposedly contained wrong information like the wrong county and the wrong date, meaning that they would likely struggle to hold up in court and probably should have never been acted on. Despite this, the crew urged law enforcement to act anyway, rushing the ordeal to assure they got their guy. And so, the police agreed, first calling Kondrat and then knocking on his door for multiple hours, though neither attempt saw any results. And growing impatient with the whole ordeal, they then called in the SWAT team to surround and eventually breach the house, which they would do around 3pm, barging into the home and surrounding Kondrat at gunpoint. As this was all happening, To Catch a Predator had their cameras trained on the outside of the home, awaiting the shot of Kondrat being ushered into a cop car and driven away. Unaware that this time, things were going to end much differently. Inside, Kondrat would yell to the officers, I'm not going to hurt anybody, before brandishing his pistol. And rather than pointing it at the officers, he instead pointed it at himself. The officers line up in formation and head to the back of the house. Then we hear a faint crack. The officers force their way in. So that's what For almost to five the minutes, show. we don't see or hear anything. Then Lieutenant Adina Barber of the Murphy Police Department comes out yeah, and tells us what happened. As they made entry, they confronted the suspect. I believe he's in the hallway, and he told them he wasn't going to hurt them. And, then and he had a pistol in his hand. This single gunshot would essentially mark the end of To Catch a Predator, as in the time following, NBC would be hit with a $105 million lawsuit from Kondrat's own sister. And though this lawsuit was settled privately with undisclosed conditions, the show was already on death's door. 
which was not helped by the national media dogpiling on to catch a predator as well as perverted justice. But now there are serious questions about what goes on behind the scenes. Whose sting was this? The police departments or the vigilantes hired by Dateline? You don't have the full transcripts? I don't know. That's exactly part of my problem. The police department can't tell me what I <coughs> the full transcripts. Did your arresting officers, did they see the chats before they made the arrest? In some cases, yes. Did they see the entire chance? Making it impossible, says District Attorney Roach, to mount a successful prosecution. Charges have been dropped against every single person arrested in the Murphy Sting. With these claims causing some to believe that the show was more interested in entertainment rather than justice, and whether that's true or not, To Catch a Predator would be canceled, marking a tragic end to one of the strangest, yet most compelling TV shows ever to be broadcast thanks solely to this grim moment. Hold up, I got cold up here, though. I had to get my space heater on. So you telling me the show got canceled? I thought something legit happened where I think I'm, mixed, I'm about to mix the wrong shows. I might be thinking of uh, Cheaters. Someone told me that uh, the host got stabbed or something. I want to say like on a boat or some sheesh. I can Google it, but I, I do that after or whatever. And maybe maybe that's not. Even, maybe it wasn't even Cheaters. But damn, it got canceled. Ah, that's wild. Oh, yeah, the family As evident by the first batch of cases in this video, many of the darkest moments in TV history come from shocking accidents or overall disturbing events that play out for the cameras to see. However, there are a select few examples where television moments only really become dark long after they're aired and more context is given. For example, in our first installment of the series, we discussed Renard Spivey. Ask him he's been married for how long? Over 20 Look at him years. though, he look mad. <laughs> you don't look happy, brother. You don't look happy. The whole time he wouldn't even run. 63-year-old Renard Spivey accused of killing his wife, 52-year-old Patricia Spivey, after an argument that turned deadly. The man who had murdered his wife years after making an appearance on television, with one joke at his expense during this time aging like milk. The concept of killers finding their way onto TV is one that I've recently become fascinated by, with the case always being brought up in tandem with this conversation being the dating game killer. In 1978, a man named Rodney Alcala had found his way onto the popular show The Dating Game, earning a date with Cheryl Bradshaw above all other contestants. However, this date would never actually materialize, as upon meeting him away from the cameras, Cheryl found the man to be creepy and ultimately declined to speak with him any further. And as it turns out, that decision may have saved her life. Oh, it did. During the time in which this episode was shot and aired, Rodney was in the midst of a massive killing spree, ending the lives of at least eight people that we know of, though many claim his true number of victims is shockingly closer to 130, due to the fact that they had found a stash of over 1,000 photographs detailing women, young boys, and men that Rodney had taken, many of which are believed to have been unidentified victims of him. And what makes this all the more chilling is the fact that Rodney had told the show that he was a photographer, and it was even mentioned during the program. Now let's see, Baxter number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. Given the shocking nature of this case, it's really no wonder why it's become so popular, especially here on YouTube. But surprisingly, there are quite a few examples of killers finding their way onto our TV screens that have happened within the past decade alone. And one that even happened within just days of writing this script. One obscure example- <laughs> Let me go back. I'm like, not my nigga Steve Harvey, dog. But I know it ain't gonna be him. <laughs> well, Bray, chill out. Yeah. happened within just days of writing this script. One obscure example comes from the show <laughs> Celebrity MasterChef, where in the background we can see an inconspicuous man serving food cooked by the contestants of the show. The man was one of a dozen unnamed chefs, just helping out typically out of view of the camera. But for this one split second, and likely to the recognition of no one, we see him. This man's name is Stephen Port, 
a 40-year-old living in South London who has since come to be known as the Grinder Killer. Stephen is responsible for the deaths of four men he met on the Grinder app, all of whom he had lured to his flat and poisoned with fatal doses of GHB before going on to violate and then dump their corpses. Yeah. With these murders transpiring not long after this fleeting moment was broadcast for the world to see, making me wonder just how many other killers have appeared in glimpses on TV that have not yet been recognized. Maybe they were walking in a crowd or hand over at a sporting event, hiding in plain sight. But killers don't just get shown as background characters or as one-off contestants for just a single episode. Sometimes they are permanently etched in the show's history. In the summer of 2020, Food Network began airing a season of Worst Cooks in America, one of their more popular shows. And this one was set to be a big one as it marked the program's 20th season. The competition was all in good fun with lots of humorous and memorable moments. Oh, not nah, nah, my nigga Steve Urkel, though. No. Was that Jaleel White? Let me see. I, want, I still want to try that purple Urkel, man. If you ever see this, I hella want to try your string. It's legal where I'm at. It's just, it's not where I'm at. <laughs> Food Network began airing a season of Worst Cooks in America, one of their more popular shows, and this one was set to be a big one, as it marked the program's 20th season. The competition was all in good fun with lots of humorous and memorable moments, leading to the eventual finale on the 2nd of July. And in that episode, the fan favorite Ariel Robinson would take home the crown as winner of the show along with a grand prize of $25,000. However, if you were to look for this season today, let's say on demand, on streaming services, or even on mm. TV, you would be That's left with right. no results, as its existence has been practically wiped from the face of the earth. And given what happened after the season ended, this comes as little surprise. Upon winning the competition, Ariel Robinson settled back into her normal life with her husband, Jerry. And after securing life-changing funds from the show, the couple made the admirable decision to foster a young girl named Victoria, whom they eventually decided to officially adopt in January of 2021. On the 6th of the month, just over a week before the adoption was set to be finalized, Ariel would take to Twitter to boast about her parenting, stating, I'm a mama bear and I'll do anything to protect my children and make sure their futures are equally bright. A statement that seemed in line with her protect my children. I'm a mama bear and I'll do anything to protect my children and make sure their futures are equally bright because they have the same opportunities and are treated as equals the way, the way God made them. There should be no hashtag white privilege, only American privilege. Hashtag equality for all. Hashtag black lives matter. To make sure their futures are equally bright. A statement that seemed in line with her already stellar reputation as being a fun-loving, good person who dedicated her life to loving her kids. However, no one could have imagined the devastating turn this family was heading for. Five days after Victoria's adoption, Ariel's husband, Jerry, would dial 911, stating, You have an emergency. Our daughter is um, not, is unresponsive. She's drunk a lot of water. We're trying to pump, like, CPR to get out. Our three-year-old daughter is soaking on water right now. Your three-year-old daughter is what? Soaking on water right now. We need help immediately. Okay, I we can't help on the way. This led to emergency responders rushing to the scene where the young girl was found unresponsive on the floor of her bedroom and was soon after declared dead. Across her body were countless bruises which Ariel claimed to have been from their attempts at CPR. Though bizarrely, during the whole ordeal, her story would quickly change as she soon began blaming her seven-year-old son, whom she stated had a history of anger issues, believing potentially he had killed her. Already, something very strange was happening with the situation, and it only became more bizarre when a forensic pathologist confirmed that Victoria had died not from choking, but from blunt force injuries and internal bleeding, essentially meaning that her death was no accident. This launched a full-scale investigation into the couple, where it would later be discovered that on the day before her death, Victoria had gotten sick at church, causing Ariel to undress her and make her walk out of the building in just her underwear telling her, oh, you're cold, you're cold. Girls that make themselves throw up deserve to be cold. This anger seemingly boiled over the next morning where ironically, Victoria was refusing to eat pancakes that Ariel had cooked, which led to Ariel I would her. too, I don't want no food from someone who won the worst cook in America award. That mean you the best at the worst cook. I ain't eating no pancakes. Ariel was refusing to eat pancakes that Ariel had cooked 
which led to Ariel grabbing her, dragging her up the stairs, and beating her with a paddle. According to Jerry, who was working in the backyard at the time, he could hear the beating from outside, claiming that it lasted almost an hour, though he did nothing to stop it. And as a result, Victoria began to bleed internally, and later would pass away due to the traumatic injuries she had suffered by the hands of her soon-to-be mother. When it was all said and done, Ariel Robinson was arrested and will now spend the rest of her life in prison. So soon and done, Ariel Robinson was arrested and will now spend the rest of her life in prison. So soon after her triumphant win on Worst Cooks. Since the news initially broke on this, the entirety of season 20 has been removed from the internet and has been wiped from the show's history. But for me, one of the most chilling moments in Ariel's history on television came soon after her victory, when a local news station would come to her home for an interview. But now, I truly am not the worst cook in America. But she is the winner of Food Network's Worst Cooks in America Season 20. Yes, I am putting mayo in a glove. Ariel Robinson lives in Simpsonville. We're inside. We see a sign proudly displayed by Ariel, touting her as the number one mom. Soon after, the same local news station would become the leading reporters on her murder case. Despite this all transpiring within just a few years, this surprisingly is not even the most recent example of a killer being prominently featured on TV, Man, as news broke of this final example hell, just uh... days ago. In January of 2020, the widely popular show Family Feud featured the Bleefnik family, who would go on to win the episode and leave a few iconic moments in its wake, with the most relevant coming from this man, Timothy Bleefnik. During one of the segments, the question was posed, what is your biggest mistake you made at your wedding? To which Timothy responds with, Honey, I love you, but said I do. Oh. <laughs> not my mistake, not my mistake. I love my wife. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble for that, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> If you've seen the show before, you know that this type of humor is the norm, and jokes like this are made in virtually every single episode. But this one would later take on a much more sinister tone due to the events that unfolded not long after the show. I mean, y'all, I tell you all the time, I don't believe in marriage, but I don't play with it neither, man. If it's something I'm believing, I, I ain't gonna play with it with my life. Like, nah, because I don't, I don't understand it enough, but hey. It's the norm, and jokes like this are made in virtually every single episode, but this one would later take on a much more sinister tone due to the events that unfolded not long after the show had aired. Just say no. Around a year after Timothy's moment in the limelight, he and his wife Rebecca would actually separate, not officially divorcing, but living in separate homes and seemingly not getting along either, as it was recently revealed that Rebecca had filed for a restraining order against both Timothy as well as his father a clear indication that she believed her life was in some sort of danger. Fast forward to February of 2023, and the two were finally making headway on finalizing an official divorce, before on the 23rd day of the month, gunshots rang out from Rebecca's home. Police say 41-year-old Rebecca Bleefnik was found by a family member Thursday. Police say she had been shot multiple times. When police arrived Damn. on scene, Rebecca was sadly no longer alive. So she it wasn't wrong. It wouldn't take long for she investigators to, get away. to turn their sights on Timothy. On March 13th, police would arrest the now 39-year-old in connection with his soon-to-be ex-wife's death, charging him with two counts of first-degree murder and blaming him for the shooting that took place at her home. With his mugshot showing him as completely unrecognizable to the man we saw on TV just years before, Dang, the whole situation like is him. incredibly disturbing. And what makes it even worse is just how beloved Timothy and his family were in their hometown. I mean, they literally had community watch parties to cheer on the family that can still be found here on YouTube. But listen, that was so much fun. I'm so happy and appreciative of the support community, so thanks. Making the events soon to come all the more tragic. And given everything that's happened since the show aired, and since Timothy said this iconic joke, I think it's very possible that there was at least some truth to his words. Yeah, I will. Damn. And that's dope, because I tell you, I love big families. And they do seem like they have a big, beautiful, happy, helping family. It definitely seems like that. I can't lie to you. But yeah, I, like I also mentioned, because with the yin, it's the yin and the yang, with the good come to bad. I do feel like having a big family, though, that those odds are in there, where it's like someone within this bunch is going to be crazy. To his words. It's like, damn. 
ya que estamos aquí trataba de conseguirla a usted si es tan amable me da una reacción para el programa ocurrido así our final entry takes us to the tragic passing of 15-year-old Yoandra Martin back in November of 1992. The young girl had recently discovered that she was 13 weeks pregnant, much to the disappointment of her family, and subsequently ended her life as a result, which momentarily thrusted her parents, Maritza Martin and Emilio Nunez, into the public eye. The two had been separated since before she was even born, with Maritza gaining full custody, something that Emilio would later claim she had used to keep his daughter away from him, as the two supposedly spent very little time together. As a result, Nunez began publicly blaming Maritza for the death of their time together. As a result, Nunez began publicly blaming Maritza for the death of their daughter, claiming that she and her new husband had been abusive towards her, and it even struck her upon discovering she was pregnant. Making matters worse, Nunez would go on to allege that Maritza never even told him that their daughter had died and had only found out an hour before the funeral from a friend. Now, I want to stress that there is absolutely no information I could find to fully confirm any of what Nunez was claiming, and with many elements of Nunez's story, the jury is still out. Though in his own mind, this truly seems to be what he believed. And this is where the dark side of television began to rear its ugly head. For whatever reason, the news station Okurio Asi had decided to cover Emilio's allegations against Maritza, seemingly taking his word at face value and launching a full-scale story into the case. It started with Emilio being interviewed by a reporter from the station named Ingrid Cruz, which transpired in the vicinity of his daughter's grave. During the questioning, Ingrid would ask him things like, what would you tell your daughter if she was still alive? And how did you feel when you saw your dead daughter in the casket? Her questions were clearly crossing the line, and things would only get worse from here, as while they were filming this segment, Maritza herself had arrived on location to Yuandra's final resting place. Doña Maritza. Oh, okay, my bad. At the beginning, I thought that was the daughter in the car, and I thought she was interviewing her, and she was already unalive in the car while she was interviewing her, and I thought that was about to be the dark moment in TV. Okay, let me go back. All right, that was the mom. All right. To Yuandra's final resting place. Doña Maritza. Upon her arrival, Nunez immediately removed himself from the situation, and Maritza was instead swarmed by Cruz, who began bombarding her with questions, each of which were ignored, as she clearly was uncomfortable and didn't <clears throat> want to speak to the cameras, and was just trying to get to her daughter's grave. It's clear in the footage that tensions were rising by the second, as it seemed apparent that Cruz was clearly attempting to provoke her into any sort of reaction. Until suddenly, the unthinkable happened. Su hija tomó esa decisión de quitarse la vida. Usted no tiene nada que decir. In a split second and out of absolutely nowhere, we see Nunez charge back into frame, as though he initially appeared to be doing the responsible thing by Damn. walking away from the conflict. He had instead actually returned to his car with the sole purpose of retrieving his pistol, which he would then use to shoot Maritza over and over and over again, all while the camera was still rolling. <laughs> Damn, that's wild, boy. Hey, get in the car. You just shot a woman, possibly coming after us. He's psychotic, man. Where am I? What funeral home am I at? ¿Cómo se llama esto? Where am I at? Somebody shot. <gasps> Maritza would be shot a total of 12 times and in turn her life would come to an end, as Nunez stood over her yelling, I should have done this a long time ago. Rest in peace. When the smoke cleared, Nunez would be arrested and sentenced to life with a possibility of parole in 25 years. And what's most frustrating is just how avoidable this really seemed to be. Maritza herself had actually requested a restraining order against Nunez not long before her murder, but was surprisingly denied, as police stated that it would only anger him more. 
with this happening despite the fact that police were already well aware of Nunez's violent temper, as authorities were literally called on scene for Yuandra's funeral, as Nunez had threatened to kill other members of the family. He was obviously a very troubled man, who following the loss of his daughter, needed help more than anything. Yet even after all this, this one news station decided to not only platform him, but to provoke him, right before the two had crossed paths, leaving us with one of the darkest moments to ever transpire in the history of television. Yeah, those questions were, were wow. I, I just like, wanted to let whoa. you guys know that I had the less censored version. Damn, that has always been crazy to me how someone can just go from loving someone to creating another life with someone to hating someone. It's like, yo, humans can mix bad, man. We can legit just have a bad chemistry. And the crazy part is, it'll start off like it, it'll seem like it's starting off like, yo, this is beautiful. This is two positives. But it's like whole time, like, no, this is going to have an ugly outcome. Not all the time. I say whole time in those situations, whatever. But I'm going to go ahead and get up out of here, though. I'm going to go ahead and enjoy my day. Hey, you do the same thing. Enjoy your day, your morning, your evening, night, whenever you're watching this video, though. But I'm out.